Last week we kicked off our series. Can we give Pastor Brandon a hand, by the way? Thank you so much for the worship team. We appreciate you guys. We kicked off the series. Pastor Jesse kicked us off last week with a series that we've entitled Convinced, Banking on Faith. And this series really is based on the premise um, and focused on Paul's writings and teachings and where he often uses banking terms and metaphors and illustrates and illustrations to describe how faith works. An example would be Pastor Jesse mentioned last week how righteousness was credited to Abraham's account, right? A credit, a credit is a favor that's been added to your life on Christ's behalf. It's something that you and I cannot earn. How many of you got a stimulus deposit in your bank account? Wow, some of y'all need to do some. You know, maybe you don't know. So a few months ago, a couple of months ago, I got this amount in my bank account, and literally I thought it was a mistake. And so whenever there's a mistake, I run to Pastor Jesse, and I said, Pastor Jesse, they, I think they got it wrong. This amount has been dropped in my account. I think they think I have too many kids or something. And, and how many of you know... That amount, I didn't do anything to earn it. And, and I, I literally, I, I felt a little bad. I felt like I, I did something wrong. I felt like I didn't deserve that much. And Paul, the apostle Paul, he uses banking terms to bring a revelation of how much you and I deserve through putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, God has given us and paid for it all so that we will step in the fullness and the abundance of the life that he's given us, the abundance of his grace, the abundance of his love, the abundance of his power, the abundance of his kindness, the abundance of his justice, the abundance of his mercy. God paid for it all so that you and I could live this life and experience it on earth. Today on Mother's Day, we're going to focus on two moms. And I love, this is what I love to do. I love to find the nobodies in scripture that nobody preaches about. I love to find the nobodies that God said, because you're a nobody, I'm going to do something significant in your life and get somebody's attention. Come on, how many of you, listen, you were a nobody, but God did something in your life and got somebody's attention. Come on. And today we're going to focus on two moms who are briefly mentioned in the Bible, yet their legacy of faith is still speaking to us today. We look at chapter two, Timothy, not chapter two, second Timothy chapter one, and we're only going to look at one verse. Can you believe it? Pastor Dean's only giving you one verse today to study. But let me give you some background. Paul is writing a letter to his spiritual son, his disciple, Timothy. And he opens up the letter by telling Timothy, hey, I've been praying for you. How do you get encouraged just knowing somebody's praying for you? Listen, somebody's laboring for you. You don't even know it, but somebody, listen, they're, they're investing in prayer for your life. And Paul's saying, Timothy, I'm praying for you. And while I've been praying for you, the Lord's been reminding me of the sincere faith that I see in your life. How many know sometimes we've got to be reminded by others what we don't see in our own life? And that's why it's so important. Listen, when you're praying, when you're going about your day and somebody comes to your mind, I've been telling our staff this, somebody comes to your mind. Listen, that's just not a thought. That's the Holy Ghost. 
Listen, and, and God is putting their name on your heart, not to just pray for them, but maybe God wants you to text them, encourage them, or pick up the phone. How many you know that's an idea right there? We don't do that anymore. Pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, I've been praying. This is what the Lord's been showing me. Or actually maybe even send them a card of encouragement. And here's Paul. He's writing the letter. He says, I've been praying for you. And as I was praying for you, God wanted me to remind you of the legacy of faith that I see in your life. He's writing to Timothy. You have to understand this. And he's encouraging him because Timothy, listen, he wrestled with the spirit of fear and timidity. And Paul is saying, listen, You've got to hold on to faith, that faith, that legacy of faith that I see in you. You've got to hold on to it. And listen, you've got to stand in faith. When that spirit of fear comes, you've got to release the spirit of faith. Come on, to come against that. 2 Timothy 1.5, and this is the verse we're going to focus on. He says, having received a reminder of the sincere faith in you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I love this. This is the, where we get the title of our message series. And I am convinced. Everybody say, I am convinced. I am convinced that it is also in you. And I just felt like this morning and in my preparation during the week, I felt like this morning that many of us are not living life convinced of the victory that Jesus has won. Many of us are not living life convinced of who we are in Christ. How many know we sang about it? I am a child of God. I am chosen. We sing it more like, unchosen, no, 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 I'm chosen by God. Come on, that should bring us out of our seat, right? I leaned over to Jesse, I said, man, you got to go save this right now. Anyway, many of us are not living life convinced of what the Holy Spirit has promised us and declared over our lives. And many of us are not living convinced that we are children of Almighty God. And this is why I've been reminding you as your pastor, I've been going back in the archives and I've been pulling out the prophetic words from uh, the late Bishop Tony Miller and I've been, I've, been re- I've been playing them and putting videos to them to remind you of what the Holy Spirit is trying to convince this church of that he is still moving and ready to move today. This morning... I believe the Holy Spirit wants to convince us to have faith to overcome whatever is coming against us. In other translations, says Paul, Paul said, I am persuaded that the faith I see in you is the real deal, Timothy. He said, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded, you can't talk me out of it. The devil shouldn't be able to talk you out of it. What I see is the real deal, Timothy. Another translation says, when I thought of your strong faith, I I remembered that it was passed down through your family line. It began with your grandmother. How many thankful for your grandma? It passed on down to your dear mother, and it's clear that you're following in their footsteps. Another translation says, it was handed down from your grandmother to your mother. And now to you. How many know if it was real in them, it can be real in you? You see, in the context of this verse, although the words are not mentioned, we are given an example of a legacy of faith being handed down from generation to generation. A legacy is a banking term, and it is defined as this. It is an amount of money or property left to someone in a will. How many know the New Testament, come on, is the will of Jesus Christ? Come on, he has left us the riches of the kingdom 
Come on, he has given us access so we can live our lives in fullness. It is a thing handed down by a predecessor, just like Pastor Scott and Karen handed down this church to Amy and I. Listen, they, they started the legacy, and I'm just stewarding the legacy. But this is the definition that I like to focus on. It's something tangible. It might be even invisible. But how many know faith, come on, can make it possible? It's things like values, things like faith, hope, and love. And today, we're talking about something money can't buy. Faith is perpetual. It's not supposed to stop with an individual. Come on, how many know it's faith to faith? Come on, faith is perpetual. It's not supposed to stop with me. What started in me, come on, must continue through me. Come on, what started in me must be handed to my children. You may have heard this, and because I, 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 I'm a church leadership geek, and I love, I love to consult and talk with pastors, and I love to, to fix things, but one of the things that's near and dear to my heart is the thing that, I, that I'm actually living I, I, I was set up in a good way here, and, and a legacy was handed me, and I was stewarding the legacy. But there are uh, many would be legacy churches that dot America's landscape. Listen, that should be legacy churches, but because there was an inability to pass it on down to the next generation, because, listen, we built it around personality. Because we built it around one person and these, these leaders and pastors were not able to let go these churches. I'm, and they're even in Sacramento. They are sitting empty. 2,500 seat sanctuaries with 100 people in them. Why? Because listen, you've got to be secure. Come on, you have to have your security in Christ. Come on, you have to be secure. Come on, to hand something, listen, to hand something off to the next generation. And listen, this church right here will never be built around a personality. Lord knows I don't want to be a, cel a celebrity. Oh, praise God for that. Listen, because listen, I understand, listen, that faith the legacy of real life church, it cannot end with me. It has to be passed on to the next generation. And so what God has called me to do, he says, honor the former, but raise up those that are coming behind you. And that's why we're a church. Listen, that's why we have a teaching team. And sometimes we're in this traditional mindset of when is the lead pastor going to speak? And, and, and we have a rotation. If you've been coming here for a couple of years, you know, because we're confident in our team who God has brought us. And so when Damien, Pastor Damien comes and preaches, I kid with the staff, the church grows. And then I say, I'm going to take another vacation. All right. Pastor Jesse comes and the word is right on. Why? Because we believe in the fivefold ministry. Listen, we cannot be pastor centric. Listen, we've got, we've got to have, come on, the evangelist, the teacher, the prophet, come on, the apostle, the pastor. We need all five, come on, to live out a healthy life in this church. And so you'll see me bringing in speakers. You'll see me building our team. And that's one of the things that God has given me and put on my heart, listen, is to raise up and release the gift of God that is in you. Listen, some of you, you've just been coming to church and there are so many gifts and skills that God has deposited in you that he wants to release in greater measure. Some of you can do things way better than I can. And guess what? You should be doing those for Jesus. Amen? Billy Graham said the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren are not money or other material things accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. And I find it remarkable that the most influential disciple 
Come on, who sat under the Apostle Paul's ministry. He had the privilege of calling him a spiritual son. He was first influenced by the faith of his grandmother Lois and his mama Eunice. And today I think it's very appropriate when we're talking about legacy that it's on Mother's Day Because so many of us have experienced the powerful influence of a grandmother, a mom, a stepmom, a spiritual mom, a guardian, a teacher, a friend who was just like a mom. Come on, can we give all the moms a shout out who influence has blessed our life? And it leads me to my first point. Things get better with grandma. You guys know that's true. So many times we wish things could be better, but I want to encourage you today, better begins with you. Grandma's name, Lois, means this, better or more desirable. So many times we wish things could be better. We're hoping someone else will step in and make our situation better. We're found wanting a better job, a better marriage, better kids, a better this, a better that. And if we're not careful, how many know we can grow bitter if we're always wanting someone else to bring our better? But here's the good news. Jesus Christ paid in full the access to the better life. And your better life begins by living your life by faith and banking, which means depending and relying on, banking on Jesus Christ for your better. The faith that Paul points out in Timothy's legacy began with his grandmother better. Everybody say better. Come on. Just say it again. Say better. Grandma better. (laughs) <laughs> Some of you saying, I wish I had a better grandma. But anyway, I don't know. <laughs> just playing, just playing. He points out in Timothy's legacy that it began with his grandma, Lois. And it is described in a variety of ways in different translations. And I just wanted to give you all the adjectives. One translation says, this faith that Paul saw in Timothy was a unfeigned faith. I didn't know what it meant either, so I looked it up. And it means sincere and genuine combined. So this faith that Timothy had was 100. Everybody say 100. It was pure as pure could be. When you talked about faith, this is the type of faith. Timothy had a unfeigned, a genuine and sincere faith. Another translation says he had an unqualified faith faith. In other words, his faith didn't fit the mold. I love that. He had an authentic faith, a true faith, an honest faith. Another paraphrase says he had a rich faith and a strong faith. But I love it. So I looked it up and in the original Greek language, the word used to describe Timothy's faith was this, an unhypocritical faith. An unhypocritical faith is a faith which is characterized by a belief that doesn't contradict my behavior. In other words, my faith produces and points to the fruit in my life. How many know the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree? Right? So you can look at my life. Right? And you can see the fruit of my life in the natural. You can look at my kids. And you can say, is there fruit? Hopefully you can say yes, because listen, I think we need to follow leaders that have fruit that begins with their families. I I truly believe it. I I believe we're in a leadership crisis where we're following people. Listen, that that they don't have, they don't meet the qualities in scripture. And listen, I, when I, when I choose to follow either, I just look at the fruit. Come on. I look at the marriage. Come on, I look at the family. Because how many know our family is the first church? That's one of the first things I said when I, when, when the, I was asked to submit my resume for this church. I said, the first thing that qualifies me to lead this church is that I've led my family well. That's, that, that's how I started out. That was the first part of the sentence. 
Nothing else qualifies. I don't care if I got an MDiv degree. I don't care if I got a pastor in this and a pastor in that, or I've been anointed by this person or that person. Listen, if my family is falling apart, I'm unqualified. I'm going down a whole nother road on another message right there. I, it bothers me. It just does. We're so caught up in, 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 and we do it. We do it. It's not necessarily uh, anybody's fault, but we, 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 we promote celebrities in the church. I, I watched a video of another pastor yesterday. Mega church in our nation. Mega church going through a separation and divorce and not taking the time to step away from the ministry so he can get touched and healed. But just apologizing. Will you love me? And yes, we should love leaders who are fallen. Amen. Man, I did not preach this in second service, but I, I mean first service. But, but, but what I'm trying to say, listen, 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 listen. Yes, have grace for the fallen. And I want to see pastors restored and leaders restored. But listen, listen, we, if a leader finds himself in that situation, we've got to be able to just let them, get them the help that they need. All right, I'll get back to my message. Sorry about that. In other words, my faith produces and points to the fruit in my life. You see, you can't believe God for great things and behave like you want to. Your behavior will always reveal, come on, what you believe. A, a, a pastor mentor of mine, he says it like this. He says, your behavior will always reveal your believer. Your believer is your heart. Your, what's in your heart? <laughs> How we behave. I mean, you know, you can't hide what's in your heart. Right? Hit your, hit, your, hit your thumb with a hammer. And how you know sometimes your heart will be revealed? <laughs> that will bring things out of your heart, right? Sometimes our behavior reveals what we really believe. And it's probable that Timothy's grandmother, Lois, began to live her life being fully convinced instead of internally conflicted. She started living her life with conviction instead of contradiction. And she most likely drew a line in the sand because, and she said, I'm not worshiping false idols anymore. You see, we don't know how she got saved. We don't know how Lois and, and Eunice got saved, but Paul, uh, Acts chapter 14 tells us that when Paul went to their city, Paul saw a man who was crippled laying on the ground and Paul noticed that this man had faith to get saved and he said, he shouted to him, he said, rise up and walk and the man rose up and walk and it, the whole situation went all wrong. Instead of mass crowds getting saved, listen, People started gathering things to worship Paul and Barnabas and said, you're gods. Look at, what, look at what you've done. And they're like, no, 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 no. The religious folks came in and they saw what was happening and they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city and thought he was dead. A crowd gathered around Paul. They were ready to have a funeral. And all of a sudden, Paul rose up and he ran back into the city and preached the gospel. And this is what historians believe when Eunice and Lois got saved. Come on. When Paul experienced a near-death experience. And at this moment, listen, Eunice drew a line in the sand and she said, I'm not worshiping false idols anymore. I ran across this picture that just really hit me and I wanted to show it to you. It said this, it's a young man with a vodka bottle turned upside down and a sign that said it ran in the family until it ran into me. And I'm just saying, I just felt like, listen, I felt like I felt like, listen, that today, listen, what's ran in your family, come on, is about to run into you. And with you, listen, you're saying, you know what? I'm not settling for a mediocre. I'm not settling for bondage. No, I want the better life. I want the more desirable life that Jesus has for me. What ran in my family has now ran into me. And guess what? It stopped with me too. 
And I believe, listen, it's possible that Grandma Lois started banking on faith that one day people would look at the fruit of her life and discover it was because she had faith in Christ that changed not only the trajectory of her life, but the trajectory of her family. You see, unhypocritical faith produces uncompromising behavior. And a lot of what was, has hindered believers for years. Listen, I've been a Christian for 30 plus years. And I can just tell you, when I was a young believer, and Amy and I laugh about this now because there's some things that we did, that we were super legalistic. Come on, we were rule followers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just being honest, right? But listen, the older I get, the older I get, Listen, the older I get, the closer and more intimate I become with God's goodness. The more intimate I become with his unconditional love, his grace, his favor. The older I get, the more intimate I get with the powerful resources of the kingdom of God. And it's possible that Grandma Lois started banking on that kind of faith. You see, a lot of what has hindered believers for years is what we are constant is that we're constantly trying to behave our way to Jesus into a relationship instead of just believing in Jesus. Can I just say that again? Because I messed it up. A lot of what has hindered believers for years is that we are constantly trying to behave our way into a relationship with Jesus instead of simply putting our faith and trust in Jesus. That's why many of us don't feel like we're good enough to serve. Pastor Jesse talked about that last week. Some of us don't even think we're good. We think if we blew it this week, we've got to take a couple weeks off of church so we can get right with God. You see, when I'm abiding with Jesus, my behavior is a result of my believing Not vice versa. Therefore, we have a lot of believers more interested in people following rules than following into a love relationship with Jesus. And in this story, life got better with grandma because grandma found Jesus. And she said, I'm not settling for a mediocre life. She said, I want the better life, the more desirable life that God has for me. It leads me to my second point, that great legacies can begin with mom's good victories. She was the daughter of Lois. Eunice was the daughter of Lois the mother of Timothy. The word, uh, the name Eunice means good victory. So in Timothy, Timothy's legacy, he had somebody in his life, come on, that said, it's going to be better for me from me on. And then he had a mom who knew how to get a good victory. Come on, somebody. But check this out. Eunice's husband was a Gentile. Acts 16, verse 1, gives us a little more about this family. But she was Jewish, as also was her mother. Her husband was a Greek. She was a Jew. They got married before she got saved. She goes to this meeting where Paul is raised up. He walks back into the city. She finds herself, and again, I'm imagining the story Her and Lois, her and her mom are at this place and Paul starts preaching the gospel and they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And now here's Eunice saved by the glory of God with an unsaved husband. This is how it happened. Again, not a lot is said about Eunice, but we can imagine the tension that existed in her household when she came to know Jesus, yet her husband was still an unbeliever. How many know that can be a tough spot for anyone? And many of us have unbelieving spouses. We have unbelieving children or other family members. We can relate to Eunice's situation. Check this out. She encounters Jesus and everything changes for her. Everything changes and she comes home and nothing's changed. I want to tell you today, don't be discouraged. Tell your neighbor, don't be discouraged. Listen, faith doesn't focus on what's not changing. Faith focuses on what God will change for you. It takes time. I believe one of the greatest challenges believers face is dealing with their unbelieving loved ones. 
And Paul had some encouragement for us. Can I give you some encouragement if you find yourself with unbelieving loved ones that you're believing for God's best for their life? Anybody need to be encouraged besides Dean today? Paul had some encouragement in 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Again, Paul, you have to understand his ministry. They're trailblazing. They're pioneering. They're planting churches. They're going into places where no one has heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen, and there's families and there's couples that are married, listen, who worship false gods. And one spouse would get saved and the other wouldn't. A husband would get saved and the wife wouldn't. A wife would get saved and a husband wouldn't. And then there's this tension. And what was happening in the Corinthian church was they were saying, well, well, he's not a believer. I'm just going to leave. And Paul said, no, 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 no. You are missing the whole deal right here. Come on. How many of you know faith is big enough to save your family? I, I need you to listen to this. In 1 Corinthians 7, 14, Paul is teaching them. He's saying for the believing wife, everybody say the believing wife. He said, for the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband. Come on, how many believing husbands I got out there? Everybody say believing husband. The believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. Now, you got to listen to me. This is what I'm trying to say. Now, what, where I don't want you to go, because Pastor Damien will check me on this, I'm not saying if, if you're saved in this church, I'm not saying to go be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. That's not, that, that's not this passage. This passage is saying there were two people married, one got saved, and one didn't. I just want to make that clear, all right? Because I don't want somebody to say, Pastor Dean said I could do it. No, 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 no. What I'm trying to, what I want you to see today is that your faith invites heaven to invade your house. Your faith, listen, can turn what might currently be a battleground in your home to a holy ground. Listen, your faith can turn what might be uneven ground. Come on, where you're, come on, where you're going back and forth. Come on, come on, where you're fighting with your hubby, you're fighting with your wifey. Come on, it seems like uneven ground. Listen, your faith can make it even ground. Your faith and revelation of what Jesus did for you and did for your family can change everything in your house, even when there's not an unbeliever, even when there's an unbeliever present in your house. Your faith and your belief, listen to me, brings God's blessing to your marriage and your family, whether they believe or not. I'm telling you, I just, I just felt the religious demons just rise up just right there. This, uh, li- listen, to, listen to what I'm saying. I didn't say it saves everyone in your household, but listen, it gives God access to get a hold of everyone in your house. Do you hear what I'm saying? There is a difference. I didn't say, listen, because you believe your unbelieving family members are automatically saying, no, no, that's not what Paul was saying. He was saying through your life and through your faith, Come on, I have now access to your house. Listen, when I got saved, listen, in my family, listen, I found out I had a godly heritage I knew nothing about. Because my parent, my parent, my dad was a Catholic, my mom was a backslidden Southern Baptist, and they got married, and so we didn't go to church. I was, I went to, I, I was experiencing religion. And so listen, it stopped with my parents. But listen, when I got saved, come on, I came home. My friend invited me to youth group. Man, I thought everybody was going to be excited. I said, Mom, guess what happened tonight? I got saved. She said, you joined a cult. I said, Mom, they were praying in the Holy Spirit. They're praying in this language. She said, that sounds like a cult. Not what I'm trying to say. Not everybody was happy. As a believer, faith gets a hold of God's blessing for your entire household. And now, listen, 30-something years, it didn't happen overnight. 
I'm here to encourage you. We're not running a sprint. We're running a marathon. Listen, God has called us to finish the race, not quit in the middle of the race. And we got so many people, listen, they're quitting on faith. They're quitting on God. They're quitting on Jesus because it didn't happen in 24 hours. It's a marathon. And now, listen, I can tell you, my sister goes to church. Come on, my mama goes to church. I had an opportunity 10 years ago to lead my dad to Christ. Listen, my cousins, listen, that were in the, now they're coming to church. Some of them are watching me right online. Hi, Pixie. Hi, Eric. Love you guys. Hey, listen, but it didn't, what I'm trying to say, it didn't start out that way. It didn't start out that way. Not everybody was happy, but how many know my faith, come on, made my house holy. Come on, my, my, my faith, listen, set my family apart. And I said, I started praying and I said, God, if you did it for them, if you did it for my friend, if you did it for my friend that was raised in a Christian family, I learned to pray, God, you can do it for me. God, if you saved his daddy, you can save my daddy. If you save their mama, you can save my mama. If you save their sister, you can save my sister. This is the kind of faith that God is calling us to. This is the radical faith that God wants to release in real life. Listen, that nobody is unreachable. Nobody is out of God's reach. You see, the believing family member, does that make sense, everybody? The believing family member can set up the entire family to be set apart. Listen, you are not disqualified from God's blessings if everyone in your home is not a believer. Do you hear me? I know that gets the religious demons fired up. But you are not disqualified from God's blessings. I've seen many of God's blessings. You are not discounted goods because you don't come from a Christian family. And sometimes I think we believe the lie because we don't have total victory. We don't have any victory. And Eunice had faith to focus on the good victories that ultimately led to a great legacy. That's what her name meant. Listen, don't be so focused, everyone. Don't be so focused on hitting the home run that you fail to celebrate the singles that get you on base. Listen, I believe, listen, I believe, and again, I'm I'm, I'm adding my own uh, imagination in this story because there's not a lot of said, but I know the legacy when I see it. And I believe Eunice didn't focus on what her husband wasn't. She focused on what her husband could become. Come on, I believe Eunice didn't focus on her husband not wanting to go to church or refusing to go to the synagogue or the small group or whatever. Listen, I believe Eunice had the kind of faith that believed where her husband could go and where God could take him. She didn't allow circumstances to stop believing for the best for her family. And instead, she started imparting and investing in her son, Timothy's fertile heart. She started believing Come on, for God's best and the big things for her son to do. She started taking responsibility. And when she started taking responsibility, come on, she started seeing the good victory. 2 Timothy 3.15 gives us a little, another little glimpse of what happened in this family. It says this. Here's Paul encouraging Timothy again. He says, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom, your grandma and your mama, you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here's what I want to say. I believe Timothy was such an anointed young leader because his mom took responsibility and acquainted him with Scripture. It leads me to my last point. Let the confidence of faith that has been passed down to you convince others to have faith in Christ. Paul, in essence, says, Timothy, when I think of you, I think of your faith. Timothy, when I pray for you, God reminded me to tell you and encourage you about the faith that I see. Timothy, when I'm crying out for you, 
God told me to tell you not to have a spirit of fear, but a love, power, and a sound mind. Oh, Timothy, rise up in faith. He said, when I think of you, I think of your faith. This morning, I want to ask you, what do you want people to think when they think about you? What do you want people to remember when they recall your life? When God reminds them of something to encourage you in, what is that thing? And then lastly, as a congregation and as a family, what do we want people to say when they talk about our church? I'll tell you what I want them to say. Man, we went to that church, we didn't even go to a Sunday service. But as soon as we walked in the door, man, these people were happy to see us. They were screaming and hollering. I was so overwhelmed when I stepped in the door, I lost it. I started crying. I hadn't been celebrated like that. That's what I want people to say. I want people to come to me like the coaches did after the sports banquet and just say, you know what? They said, this beats the round table pizza party we were going to do by far. That's what I want people to say about us. That's the legacy that I want to create in this community. And this is the legacy, listen, that I believe God has placed me as steward over. Listen, that I want to hand off to the generation that's coming behind me. And I want to say, run, 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 run. Listen, the harvest fields that I didn't reap, they're ready to be reaped. I didn't get to enjoy that harvest. But guess what? That harvest is waiting for you. That's what I want. Come on, the generation that's coming behind us to say about this church. Paul said, I am convinced. Church, can I tell you when I look at you as your pastor, I say, I am convinced. Pastor Damien and Stacy, I'm convinced. Listen, that this place, listen, will launch you to the nation and the nations. I am convinced. I am convinced that you're looking at me. But the things that I see, you do not see, but I am persuaded. Listen, as that gift in you that is laid dormant in you is released, I believe, listen, your life is going to change. And those that you influence and are going to be impacted by what's released through your life. You can't tell me any differently. You're going to lose that argument every time. Why? Because I have eyes to see. I have eyes to see. What's in this church, listen, if it is released, come on, and it is embraced, listen, will turn this community upside down. Listen, it'll turn your family upside right. Hallelujah. It's clear, Paul said, that what I see, come on, I seen in your grandmama. Come on, I seen in your mama. Oh, no, no, you can't run from it, Timothy. Stop being afraid. Stop running from it. Stop running scared. Tim no, no, no. You need to embrace this legacy of faith. Come on, that God has handed you. Come on. One of the most influential disciples in Paul's ministry picked up where Paul left off because he was convinced. Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. I just want to leave you with this. Church, as your pastor, I am convinced. You can't talk me out of it. I would have left during the pandemic. Church, I am convinced. But I need to ask you, are you? Are you banking on faith? Are you banking on somebody else to make your life better? Today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, and I've made a commitment to myself, to my staff, that every Sunday, we're going to ask the question, listen, if you're not trusting and relying on Jesus, you're not fully convinced this morning 
but you would love to put your trust in Jesus and you would say today, you know what? The better is gonna begin with me. If that's you, is there anybody in the house that I could just simply pray for? And you say, you know what? I'm drawing a line. The better is gonna start with me. Is there anybody? I don't wanna move on before that. Yes, anybody else? You say the better is gonna start with me. Yes, anybody else? You said the yes. Anybody else? The better is gonna start with me. Yes, the better is gonna start with me. Anybody else? Yes, yes. Come on. Hallelujah. Let's just pray this prayer together for those that raise their hands. Can we all pray it together? Can we say, dear Lord Jesus, Today, I'm banking on you. I'm depending on you. I'm relying on you because I'm surrendering my life to you. I give you my heart and I give you my life. Everything that I have is yours. I ask you to come into my life. Lord, I make you Lord of my life. I ask you to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with your goodness. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your joy. Fill me with your forgiveness. Fill me with your kindness. Lord, I give everything to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, amen. Welcome, welcome to RLC.